If you're curious to hear a little music from our guest Carla Lucero, who we spoke to in our most recent episode, check out E4TT's annual concert of music by women and non-binary composers, Midnight Serenades, on January 25th. Welcome to For Good Measure, an interview series celebrating diverse composers and other creative artists sponsored by a grant from the California Arts Council. I'm Nanette McGinnis, Artistic Executive Director of Ensemble for These Times. In this week's episode, we continue our conversation with Erica Oba, who we spoke to in May 2022. What is your compositional process like? It really depends on who I'm writing for and what context. Uh, But I would say that I found the most fruitful um, kind of like method or uh, steps uh, is when I start by improvising. If I start at the piano and like just record myself improvising different things, um, that's generally like the strongest way that I've found. To, I've tried other things too, but um, I, I'm finding that that's generally the, uh, the strongest starting point for me. Um, for some projects, uh, if I'm not collaborating with someone else and given like, you know, like, well, this is what the piece is about. Um, I found that like thinking conceptually and thematically is helpful to me as well. So if I'm writing like uh, a chamber music piece for like a, a group that I'm not in, for example, if I'm not performing in that ensemble, um, sometimes that takes a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> mining to think through like well where am I going with this but once I have that seed of an idea kind of improvising around whatever that concept is and then recording myself and then going back and listening and seeing if I like it and then maybe transcribing a snippet and then working from there is um, I think a useful way to approach things for me personally. You've expressed interest in exploring ritual, diasporic identities, and community through performance. Could you tell us more about this? Yeah, so uh, I've had the good fortune of being able to work with a lot of different types of performing artists, dancers, like actors, uh, playwrights, um, in addition to you know all the fabulous musicians I'm surrounded by. And I feel like you know the Bay Area has a really rich scene for people working in different cultural practices and kind of exploring how to... I don't know, create new things, drawing on uh, different traditions. And there's a couple choreographers in particular who I feel like really influenced how I think about my own creative process and the kind of things I might want to make. So there's a wonderful choreographer, Samay Dizon, um, who is a Filipina uh, choreographer who I've gotten to work with a couple times and she's done some incredible like deep deep work uh drawing on uh different spiritual cultural traditions from her heritage and but like kind of setting them in a modern dance context and creating kind of these like new ritual spaces and I don't know just seeing how she worked was pretty transformative for me and seeing the effect that that like deep intentional practice can have on the people she's performing with and also the audiences and kind of like the community spaces spaces that she's building through that work. Um, and then another choreographer I've gotten to work with is Bib Chanel Bilben, who is a Congolese choreographer. And he also, um, I mean, in some ways, similar to Samay, drawing on some like various uh, spiritual, cultural, different traditions from his own heritage and then uh, kind of putting them in a more uh, modern dance context, but uh, but still very, very different, like only similar in that they're like kind of exploring these, que- like some of the similar questions, but, you know, the way it manifests, you know, they each have their own practice that uh, is deep and involved in their own ways. Uh, but I've gotten to play with him a little bit and yeah, it's just seeing like the communities he's building out of these things and kind of exploring how to, you know, create something new um, that has deep relevance for the people who are participating in it, either as performers or audience members, um, was just, like, deeply moving to me to be able to see that. And uh, I feel like there are other uh, musicians and composers also exploring some of these similar threads. So um, 
that's been really stimulating and interesting for me and something that I'm continuing to think about how to integrate into my own work. You've worked as a dance accompanist at Mills College and Berkeley Ballet Theater. Has that also informed your practice? Yeah, I, I think I got my start working with dancers, I think, when I was doing dance accompaniment work at Mills College and then shortly after that at Berkeley Ballet Theater. Um, and that was as a pianist. I was doing, you know, p- piano accompaniment work for their dance classes. And... Uh, yeah, I got to do ballet and some modern dance. Um, and regardless of the type of music, I was mostly improvising on piano. So I feel like those experiences made me a better improviser just across the board because, you know, you have to respond in real time and really give something uh, specific. <laughs> you have to give energy and be involved and, you know, in communication with the dancers and dance instructors. Um, so I feel like that definitely affected just how I approach music since then. Um, and now in my performing life, I, I work quite a bit with dancers, but primarily as an improvising flute player. <laughs> so the, con- <laughs> <laughs> the content of what I'm doing is a little bit different. Um, but I feel like the kind of the mentality I approach it with is coming from a similar place, which is, uh, you know, collaboration and listening and paying attention and tuning, tuning into what people doing something completely different from what I'm doing and what I have, you know, no idea how they do what they do. (laughs) Um, But uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. I absolutely love working with dancers. So for you, composing dance music and classical chamber music are very different practices. Is there any cross-pollination? Most of the music I've done for dancers has been mostly improvised. I mean, it composed in the sense that some of it I might like come up with, you know, some sort of concept or structure that I'm working with, depending on what's being asked of me. Um, but generally not through composed music for dancers. Um, I did do uh, like I recorded like a fixed media thing for a Zoom dance performance during the pandemic that I was actually very happy with how, that collaboration process and what came out of it. Um, So, and I I guess that's like the most fixed thing I've done. And that wasn't really like, I wasn't notating any of it, Uh, but it was like a fixed composition in that way. Some of my concert music um, has, again, depending on the performers might have some sections of improvisation, but um, I guess compared to the dance work, significantly more composed. (laughs) In terms of process, I think one of the things I've gotten out of working with dancers is just <clears throat> kind of the immediacy of live performance, like the energy of live performance, uh, which, you know, con- concert music has as well. Uh, but I feel like working with dancers has pushed me to really like think harder about how to like really be immediate and present um, in, in performance. So when I'm writing, you know, that's an energy that I'm trying to cultivate and channel. And also just, you know, from like the perspective of like, uh, movement based music, having, you know, certain characteristics that I think are now just part of, you know, uh, how I think about music and not, not to say that everything I write is going to be like, you know, like a danceable (laughs) groove based thing. Um, but, maybe even more thinking about gestural energy, I think, is is something that um, I think about a lot when I'm composing, so. Right, that you've developed your own kind of gestural vocabulary or repertoire of vocabularies that you can pull on when you're thinking visually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for listening to For Good Measure, and a special thank you to our guest, Erica Oba, for joining us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast by clicking on the subscribe button and support us by sharing it with your friends, posting about it on social media, and leaving us a rating and a review. To learn more about E4TT, our concert season online and in the Bay Area, or to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit us at www.e4tt.org. This podcast is made possible in part by a grant from the California Arts Council and generous donors like you. Four Good Measures produced by Nanette McGinnis and Ensemble for These Times and designed by Brennan Stokes. With special thanks to audio engineer extraordinaire Stephanie Newman 
Remember to keep supporting equity in the arts and tune in next week for good measure.